And I went out and saw these homeless people. Exactly that. Mm. They were people. Mm. All my stereotypes of them being druggies, alcoholics. Yeah, some people are drug addicts. Some people are alcoholics. Some people have relationship issues. Mm. Some people are really struggling in life, but they're people. Mm. And I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated. Hello, welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have an incredible guest with us and his name is Krish Patel. Now Krish is a founder of Tales to Inspire, a platform that shares people's stories to encourage people to never ever give up. Uh, he also helps run Brew Power, a homeless outreach group here in Manchester. Due to this, he then decided to swim all 53 miles of the lakes in the Lake District National Park to help homeless people go from the streets and back to the, their feet. Uh, he has run four marathons in four days and raised money uh, to build a school in Uganda to educate 150 people. Uh, he also has uh, a Tales to Inspire podcast and is an author of Tales to Inspire book. Now let's have a chat with him. So hi guys, welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Uh, today we have a very, very special guest, Krish Patel. Now I met Krish Patel at um, actually one of my talks and um, uh, soon after that we became friends and um, he shared my story on his platform, Tales to Inspire. Um, so uh, I did not know much about him, but then I found out he has an, an inspiring story to uh, tell himself. So um, I thought, why not get him on this podcast and interview this awesome guy? <laughs> so yeah, um, how are you doing, Krish? Hi, hi, Madea. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Honestly, I'm, I'm very well. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. So we're going to get uh, head straight into the questions because I can't wait for this interview. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so uh, tell, tell us a bit about, about yourself. So I'm Chris Patel. I'm um, the founder of Tales to Inspire, uh, taleswinspire.com. It's a platform where we share people's inspirational stories around the world to encourage people to never give up. But my journey to become the founder of Tales to Inspire is quite an indifferent one that you wouldn't expect. Um, I'm a local boy from Bolton in Manchester. Mm -hmm. uh, my first memories on this earth were me playing football. I wanted to be a professional footballer. Um, but two things. I was a really fat kid. And number two, I am half Indian, half English. So when I was playing football, people would say to me, you belong on the cricket field. Or they would call me a Paki and all those kind of racist kind of things. So I was never really given a chance to play football. But thankfully, at the age of 16, I, uh, sorry, age of 18, I managed to become a professional footballer for the first year at a team called Berry Football Club. Got to play against some of the best players in the world. I thought I made it. And that's where really life started to take a turn for the down and I, um, for the worse, sorry. And I started to uh, see some of the negative things like the depression, things like that. So that's kind of a little bit about my background and where I'm from. Um, to show you a little bit about those small things. And I don't know if you want to go into any details about that or. Yeah. Um, well, were you spiritual at that point? Were you into spirituality, religion or anything like that? I love that question, right? So spirituality and religion is a, is a great question because half my family's Indian, so Hindu. The other far, half of the family is like English, so Christian. But my mum and dad aren't too bad. Like my dad would say he knows he's Hindu, but he doesn't know three gods. Um, and my mum would say she's a, a Christian, but, um, well, maybe not now, but she would have said she's a Christian, um, but she doesn't go to church or anything like that. So, um, but whenever I went to church when I was a kid, I'd always get told off if I asked questions. And whenever I went to the temple as a kid, if I asked questions, I'd always get told off. And it was all a bunch of mumbo jumbo. I didn't understand it. But it looked like a lot of people begging and asking for something. And I saw religion as this thing that killed the most people in the world. And um, this religion causes massive divides through people. Um, and the fact that we don't see each other as people, we start to come to our categories of I'm a Hindu, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Christian. And that defines me and you're different to me. And I was very much against religion um, up until the age of about 20, 21. I was 
very, very much against, against religion and didn't really understand what the hell spirituality was. So do, do you see a difference between spirituality and religion? Because there, there, I feel like there's a divide happening right now where religion is like organized, whereas spirituality, there's more of a, I feel a sense of a tribal, uh, go with your gut, your instinct, your inner self and sort of thing. Do you see, um, do you see that in religion as well as, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, because um, I, I never, when I went to these religious places, when I went to the church or the, or the temple, now I practice Nietzsche and Buddhism, um, but we never talked about in the other religions of spirituality at all. So you would go to it and it'd be the religion and your focus would be that, the main focus of the religion, whether it's Jesus or whether it's one of the gods or the temple or whatever. So it was always on the religion, not the spirituality. So I, I feel like, the spirituality side of things is probably the most important part of it because that's where you get deep. Yeah. Um, now I'm not saying they're not connected. You can be religious and spiritual. I probably think that every, every religion has a spiritual side of things, but um, how much they discuss about it. I mean, I went to a funeral recently and um, it really got to me that the fact that they said the head of the funeral, the, the head of the, the religion's name, I don't really want to, dumb down or, or be negative towards a religion, but they said that person or that, that God's name more than they said the person's name. Hmm. Now, now, the person's died. You said their name three times, hmm. but you've said the God's name 13 times. Hmm. Like wh for me, that was like a real big smack in the face. Like where, where are we? Are we, are we just, are we just worshiping this thing and forgetting about the people? So I feel like, every single religion has to be for the people, number one. Mm -hmm. And if it's not the main focus is the people, then really what's the point in, in the religion, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah but spirituality, a hundred percent, two massive differences. And I feel like you're, you're right that I think religion is actually really important. Now my whole, tr my whole thought process towards religion is huge right now. I, th I think it's but the way we look at religion, especially in this modern era of millennials, like we automatically like me negative, negative, negative. Yeah. Um, but I think religion can keep, play a key role in society um, for the future. If we truly see religion for what it's supposed to be. Mm. Now you said, um, you know, you wanted, you were a footballer, so you made it to America. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So I'll tell Yeah. So basically at 18, I became a professional footballer. I got to play against people like, well, people like Paul Scholes, my, my personal idol, against players Manchester United, Manchester City, um, Liverpool, basically got to play against some of the best players in the world, right? And I was injured during my first year for a lot of the time, and the guys were doing great. They got promoted, and I got released from my contract. I remember going to, during that year that I was injured, I remember waking up at 9.30 in the morning. I'd get into the physio room to, to, to treat my injuries, and then at 11 o'clock, 11.30, I'd be back on my mum and dad's sofa, like depressed, like, what am I doing in my life? I dropped out of school when I was 16 um, to play professional football. And I would literally end up going to the casino, um, going basically to the local casino here in Bolton, playing poker. I wasn't even spending a lot of money. I was just wasting time. I actually remember Medea getting in my car and just driving sometimes. Mm. And I wasn't going anywhere. I was just driving, like with no aim of going just to waste time. My friends were at university or working. I was the only one during the day, like doing nothing. And I didn't know what to do in my life. So I got released um, at the what was I, 19 or 20 years old. And um, I was like, what am I going to do in my life? Like, I'm feeling, I'm depressed. I, I want to just drink. I want to go to the casino. Um, and then I got this opportunity to go to California to play football. Um, so I got the opportunity, it went like this. I got California, live in a mansion, um, great facilities, full ride scholarship, uh, go to university and play football, living close to a beach. Uh, and I was like, by the way, I was very shallow at this time. I cared about girls, cars, money, fashion, like, like all that kind of superficial crap. Mm -hmm. And I was like, can you imagine California, 20 year old boy, like I think in American pie parties, girls, whatever. I'm like, yeah. so I was, I was like, cheerio mum, cheerio dad. <laughs> and I, 
I got to California and I got to a small town called Susanville, California. Now, Susanville is not in South California, in near LA or San Diego or on the beach. I was in North California. It was minus 20 degrees in the winter, freezing cold. I'd packed a bag full of shorts, flip-flops, a snorkel, like ready for the beach. It was freezing cold in the winter. <laughs> um, I was in a house with 13 people um, with a three-bedroom house. We had one bathroom between us. Um, so that mansion wasn't really a mansion. It was, it was tiny. Um, my scholarship was lied to the facilities. I was playing football on a baseball field. Um, there was 55 players for a 23 person team and Susanville, California has 12 and a half thousand people. For example, I think it's 12 and a half thousand people as a population, nine and a half thousand people out of that 12 and a half thousand are in one of the three prisons in the town. Oh so, my God. <laughs> So like you've got a maximum security prison where murderers and rapists from the whole of California go to. Mm. So that's four and a half thousand people in this prison. Got medium security prison where there's another 4,000 people. And then around, I don't know, 500 people in a juvenile delinquency prison, um, which is like a young offenders prison. So everything evolves around this, these prisons. So you can start to imagine the negativity and the, I was lied to. The coach lied to me. I hated the coach. He's the one who brought me out there. He lied to me. I was playing against Manchester United a year ago. Mm. Now I'm playing on a baseball field, <laughs> living with 13 guys in freezing cold weather. My scholarship's lied to. I've told my parents I'm going to go away for four years. I'm not coming back. And I was like furious. Um, re I was so angry. Angry Anger is my natural state. So yeah. um, I um, basically told one of the guys, I said, I'm going, I'm leaving. I said, I'm going, I said, basically, have you ever known anyone who's always happy and, and like vibrant? Probably is you. To be <laughs> well, I have off days. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So like you have, so we had one of those guys in our team who's called Gabby He's from Brazil and he was always smiling, always happy. He only spoke a little bit of English and he wasn't even in the starting 11 for the football team. Mm -hmm. And I hated this guy because he was so happy. And I was like, what has he got to be happy about? He was living in a basement at the time. Mm. And um, he was always like, bro, never give up. I remember these words for the rest of my life. And I was, when, I, when he used to say those words, I was like, man, I hate you. Uh, that was literally what I, I was like, what has he got to be happy about? And then one day I said to Gabby, I said, Gabby, I'm going back to Bolton. I cannot stand it here anymore. Um, and he said, Chris, if you keep running away from your obstacles, you're never going to overcome anything in your life. Mm. And that was the whole turning, the start to the turning point, that one moment where he saw the potential in me when I didn't see the potential in me. And mm. um, he took me under his wing. He actually invited me to a Buddhist meeting. So he's practicing Nietzsche and Buddhism. And um, I said, bro, I don't believe in Buddhism. I don't believe in Buddha. I don't believe in God. I, I don't believe, I hate religion. Don't like any of that. And I, he was like, there's going to be some free food for you. <laughs> and I was like, a student, no money. I was thinking free food and Brazilian. So you think obviously there's going to be good food. So I was like, right, I'll go. And they were all chanting this mantra, Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo. They were chanting Nam Yo Renge Kyo, Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo. All to this like piece of paper. And I was like, what the hell is this? Like, I was like, get me out of here. But because the food wasn't until the end and it was at the back of the room and you couldn't get it. So I had to wait. And the other thing was, I didn't want to disrespect my friends, right? So I stayed for the chanting. For, it, took, it felt like forever it went on. Mm. And um, yeah, and it got to that point and that finished. And then they started talking about life. And I never, ever started to talk about life and solutions to getting through life. Mm. And I was like, wow, I felt like that. And oh, that's me right now. Or I, I remember that when I was 13 years old and something. And we started talking about things and started to see everyone's potential and how you could really get through these things and connecting people. Mm. And it was like, it, they made it sound so simple, but also so, so effective that you could encourage others to do the same. Mm. And that was really my transformation point that America was wonderful for football. Um, from there, I moved from Susanville, California to Montgomery, Alabama, which is the birth rights, the civil rights movement in, Man in Manchester, in Montgomery, in, in the USA. Mm. And the place where Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, the first black, uh, black uh, vote in America was. Mm. Lots of things in, in Montgomery, Alabama happened. And people said, Chris, you're going to Montgomery. You can't go to Montgomery, Alabama. Like, it's just like going back in time, man. And I was like, hey, I've lived, I survived Susanville, California. I was like, bring on Montgomery, Alabama, right? 
um i loved it i i absolutely loved it um and yeah. yeah, it was it was amazing. The the people hospitality was unbelievable, and mm. people hated it in Montgomery. I was, but they didn't know how I'd 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 been through my hell and overcome it. So mm. yeah, Montgomery was some of the most precious moments of my life. I will, will forever cherish Montgomery, Alabama, and even Susanville, California. Mm. The hardest times you go through are some of the strongest bonds you meet. You you connect with people, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've I made friends for life that. I know that I can rely on them. I may not speak to people every day, but I know if they need me or when I need them, boom, you're yeah. there, you know, yeah. friends for life, simple. Um, now you, obviously there's some things that didn't go to plan with your football and everything. And you, you said that you entered in a period of depression. Now there's a, probably a lot of people out there who have expect, expectations uh, for themselves, even when they want to become a footballer, a doctor or whatever. Um, now it's not happening for them what are, what are sort of a message that you would give to them to give them hope or um what were you, what was your depression like when i when i get depressed it's, it's something that comes come still comes today not many people know about that but mm. i kind of hide it well i guess mm. um because i've got this bubbly exterior a lot of people don't see it mm. but um when i get depressed it's like this massive cloud comes over my head mm. massive like mm. i doubt everything Mm. everything I do I'm like why am I doing this how should I do this or like why like you know I'm, I, I'm not making money and like I, I see the negative in everything I do um and it's usually when I have no sense of direction mm. that I don't know where my goal is I don't know where I'm heading mm. and I start to really doubt myself and um often I feel overwhelmed I remember with George George Floyd when he passed away and I, I watched the video and I've been trying to do all this good for the last two, three years or whatever it is. And I just got so overwhelmed that like, I just went into this like one, two, three days of depression. I was like, why am I? Cause I, I just, it just over, it overcomes you, you know? And mm. thankfully now I know that I, I can get through it. It's not a depression that I'm, I feel suicidal. It's, mm. but it is a depression where I question life. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of a sense of, um, not being in control of your life we tend to run away from things we want to accomplish so many things but um who's to say that your soul path is something else you know um like you said you want to wanted to be a footballer but that was in your soul's path you know mm. uh so what sort of message would you give to those uh kids youngsters um if they're in in that depression that period of oh my god i don't know i feel so lost right now um i think it's so this is where religion really is interesting that many religions say that you're given a mission, that you've been given a mission from a God or from a outer source. Yeah. But I really believe that, and this is what Nietzsche Buddhism talks about as well, is that your mission is yours and yours alone. You're mm. unique and you have it. It's mm. in you. The question is, are you going to unearth it? Yeah. So for example, a diamond is only a diamond because it rubs up against other diamonds and it takes a long time to unearth that diamond often. The question is, are you going to unearth your own diamond to find your own mission or to find your own purpose? My superficial mission or my mission originally was, I wanted to be a footballer. It's my passion. That's what I wanted to be, right? The question is where that passion leads me is into my true passion right now. And my true passion right now may lead me somewhere else. That's completely fine. But I know I'm going with my passion. I'm not going with my money that I thought I wanted to, and I wanted to be rich and I wanted to do all this didn't really give me joy. I'm not going with the girls because I really know that that didn't give me joy, you know? <laughs> the right person at the right time will give me joy, but I'm not gonna force that. Mm. So I really feel that if you're going through depression now, if you're going through struggles and with COVID, a lot of people are gonna be going through that kind of stuff, you know? Um, but I really feel, um, there's a guy called Robin Sharma. He, he wrote, he's an author, he writes some fantastic books. And he says that your daily behavior um, follows the deepest, your deepest beliefs. Mm. All right so mm. your day your daily behavior follows your deepest beliefs mm. and that if you keep if you know who you are you know your actions will follow that oh I so you, you really need to know who you are mm. first and foremost and then so stop looking outside of yourself and start to look deep within mm. and bring it out of yourself instead of asking because okay. if you ask we beg for something you become a victim mm. like please give me or why me no Take the responsibility. Remember when you point, when you point your finger at someone, 
three fingers point back at you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's always remembering. And it's the hardest thing to take responsibility for mm. because no one wants to do it, including myself. Um, and I have to put a, a, a little thing in here with this. I'm not factually, I'm not a guru. I'm not a nothing. Like the things I may say today, I may discover next year that I talk about something completely different. Mm. And that's completely fine because this is me right in this moment right now for what I, where I am and where I feel society is and where I feel my part is, you know? Mm -hmm. So you said, um, so the, when your friend introduced you to Buddhism, that's what, that was your turning point. So 100%. tell us a bit uh, more about that. What, what sort of things that you did after, you know, being around such a wise people, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, well, the thing that about it was that about Nietzsche and Buddhism, I've always been against temples, clergy. Mm -hmm. I've always been against monks and, and all that kind of stuff. Not against them, but I've always been like questioning why should you give money to someone who's in the hierarchy mm. above you? Mm. Um, so one of the things that I saw, it's a lay community of just normal people. Mm. There's no there's no monks, there's no temples, there's no none of that. And you start to see people as people because I'm a, I'm a leader in the SGI, in Nietzsche and Buddhism. In the, and in the, the, the organization is called the SGI, which means Value Creation Society in Japanese. And I started to see that these people were taking action. They weren't all talk. I remember going to, I remember going to a friend's uh, religion and basically had a deal with her that I would go to her religion service on a Sunday and then she would come to a Buddhist meeting afterwards. I remember going in and seeing one of the guys talking and he was like a, a pastor or whatever. And he would say, don't drink and don't have sex. And I know on that Friday night, he was out at a party with me and he was drinking and I know he was with some girls. So like, I'm thinking that like, on a Sunday morning, why is, why is he talking like that? You know, and yeah. he's not talking. We do, we often do things Sunday to Sunday, mm. like, and we're good on a Sunday or on a certain day of the week. And it's, it's great for like, it's like dieting. You diet Monday to Wednesday, but what about the rest? Mm. Or you go to work Monday to Friday. Mm. That's five sevenths of you. I'm looking forward to the weekend. I can't wait for the weekend. That's mm. two sevenths of your week, it's two sevenths of your life. Mm. Why not live for the five sevens? Mm. So I started to realize that with these people, the vibrant energy of these people to show that you can really overcome anything. Mm. One of the things that really blew my mind was um, Daisaku Okada, who's the, the, um, the president of the organization. He says, and he's got over three, he's got 396 honorary doctorates from universities, universities around the world. Mm. Um, and he, he basically says, bring on obstacles as youth, as young, mm. youthful people, we mm. should not live a comfortable life, but we should go and seek obstacles. Yeah. And I was like, That's... when I first heard that, I was like, this guy is crazy. Like, I want the comfortable life on a beach. Give me it there, you know? And, um, and he was like, no, you want to seek obstacles so you can overcome them and develop your life. Mm. And mm. I saw everyone seeking these, ob not seeking them stupid life, but really trying to overcome their own obstacles mm. to be the best that they can be. Mm. Um, so to really embrace those struggles, you know? Mm. So basically you're saying that you were most part, you were running away from your feelings and emotions as well as, uh, you know, you weren't facing them. So do you yeah. think there's a, there's a huge problem in our society? Uh, you know, they run to drugs, they run to alcohol. They don't face that feelings and emotions. Do you think there's a huge problem yeah. in our society at the moment? Yeah, I think, I think there's a, a huge problem in Arnold Toynbee. He's a historian, amazing historian um, from, the, from England. Um, he passed away a little while ago, but he talks about a true religion a true, and, a, and a better age for humanity is one of self-mastery. Mm -hmm. So when we can master ourselves, mm -hmm. that's where we truly can then help others. Mm -hmm. Only then can we truly help others, help yeah. them master themselves as well. Yeah, that's... And if we did that and took action for ourselves through self mastery, then really the whole world would be a better place. So would you tr like, I hear, I remember going to college in America and I remember people saying, Oh, you should let us do weed and you should let us smoke cannabis and you should let us do these drugs and these stuff and drink alcohol and all this kind of stuff. But the question is that I always ask is, would you let a pilot, um, would you let a pilot high on drugs fly a plane? <laughs> no. Like, would you let a surgeon who's about to commit uh, to do surgery on you um, get pissed and drink no. beforehand? So my question is, yeah, I understand. Like, we need to be flexible, but 
and and there is no I don't believe in absolute I, I don't I hate saying absolutes and absolute this because mm. there's always middle ground that we need to understand and discuss yeah but um yeah I definitely feel that we're in an age where we can blame others we don't take responsibility yeah we we um we don't see that actually we can make a difference in this world um one of the things that we'll probably get to this later during what I talk about but some of my charitable stuff that I started to do and I, I started to realize like my phone, I could message people on Facebook around the world. Yeah. Why, why can't I help people around the world? Mm. You know, and yeah. I started to see us as a global community. So mm. there's definitely, um, yeah, not taking responsibility is, is certain, certainly a thing that we can blame each other and we can go through things, but the things is as males as well. Um, we don't talk about this stuff. Yeah. We really don't. Vulnerability um, amongst males, especially males, it's, it's very rare. So I want to um, get on to your, you working with the homeless people. Now, when I met you, um, I thought it was, you're such an amazing guy. You, you go out every two, every two weeks, is it, to help the homeless, you feed the homeless. And every week, quite, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every week. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I hats off to you because not many people are willing to do that because we're so lost in Matrix right now. We're not willing to see the problem in society right now. Um, so tell us about how how that started. What made you think, oh, I want to help the homeless. I want to do this. So it kind of started with um, a little bit beforehand. So 2016, I'd, I got my degree in business in Alabama. And I basically realized that everything had been about me, about my business degree, about me, 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 my football, my life. And I wanted to do something for others. Simple. I really wanted to show that, like I said, I can Facebook message someone around the world. Why can't I help someone? Mm. So I wanted to I wanted to travel, but I didn't want to do what everyone was doing at the time and traveling and going around Southeast Asia and just enjoying the travel and doing a little bit of volunteer work. But really just basically that's there for their conscience and not really making a difference, you know. And I'm not judging people for that. I, one of the things I hate to do is judge. Um, and I'm always going to say I'm the, I'm, I'm the last person to judge anyone for anything. And... Um, because I've probably been there and done it myself. Um, so I wanted to make a difference. So I said I was going to run four marathons in four days. I've never run a marathon before. I hate running unless there's a ball involved. Mm -hmm. And I would run from the northwest of England to the northeast. I would call it the Road to Uganda campaign. And I would go over to Uganda and I would do something to create a sustainable future for people. Amazing. And I had no idea. People would say, Chris, where's this money going to? I'd be like, no idea. I just know it's going to something sustainable in Uganda. They're like, oh, have you been to Uganda before? I'm like, nope, never been to Africa. I'm like, why are you going to Uganda? I'm like, well, I kind of just wanted to go to Africa and span the globe around that area and pointed the finger on it and ended up going to Uganda. So people were like, you're crazy, Chris. You got and What are you going to do with the money once you get there? I was like, well, I'm going to find someone. I'm going to trust them and I'm going to give them the money to make something sustainable. And people were like, mate, you can't build trust like that. I was only there for three weeks because I had to be back in America. You can't build trust like that in three weeks. And I was like, okay, no problem. And I, I took people's advice. Sometimes it's nice to see people's advice, but not always take it on because they don't understand. People don't understand you sometimes, you know, yeah. and this is where we have a, an issue with a certain society. Um, well, Indian, uh, Indian, we always respect our elders, which is great. We should respect our elders. Mm -hmm. However, our elders doesn't just because you're old doesn't mean you're wise. Oh yeah. Um, oh, and yeah. age does not bring wisdom. Experience brings wisdom. Mm-hmm. And overcoming obstacles brings wisdom. Yes. So I basically did this. It was amazing. I, I did it. I went to Uganda. I started volunteering and I was 24 years old at the time. I ran four marathons, four days, raised enough money, went to Uganda, didn't tell anybody that I had any money. Um, started volunteering, coaching football, working with disabled children in an orphanage with women's empowerment. It was incredible, incredible. Mm -hmm. And saw a building there um, at this school that I was working at and it was like a, it was like a skeleton structure. And I saw all these children in the village just sitting there, like doing nothing or playing football or whatever. And I was like, all these children in the village, but there's a school here. Why aren't they going to school? And the headmaster said that there's not enough, there's not enough, um, they don't have enough room for them. Mm -hmm. As in there's a hundred, there's, there's not enough room. So he said, if we built a building here, we could educate another 150 children. We have the teachers in the village who could do it and we have everything ready. Um, so I was like, right, that's where the money's going. And I actually, today, um, it's called Peter, the headmaster. He literally just sent me a message on WhatsApp, sending me a picture of the building saying it's looking beautiful and the kids are loving it. And um, 
so yeah, that was my first taste every, every year. Um, so for the age of 25, 24, it took me about 22 months. I had to go back to the USA project management from there and took about 22 months. And we built a school or a schoolhouse at the school to educate 150 children every single term oh with the road to Uganda campaign. And it was my first real taste of, of helping others. And I loved it. It was the best feeling ever. Like, yeah. I was like, yes, <laughs> like, like being selfless is actually sometimes being selfish. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. when I say that, I mean like, like we, we can't, sometimes we say, oh, do it all for someone else, do it all for someone else. But then you forget that you need to develop yourself. Mm-hmm. Then you say, if I do it all for myself, I do it all for myself. Then you forget that there's other people out there and you need to help others as well. So mm-hmm. finding that balance is always very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always find that if you're being selfless, you're also helping yourself out at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Um, I agree with that. So, yeah. So from there, I, I, I finished Uganda and um, I finished in Uganda, went to open the school in Uganda in 2018 and the start of 2018. And I went to go back to the USA where my job was, my car was, my whole last six years of my life. And my I couldn't get back in the country. Oh, could you? And I was like, oh, why? My, like, the reason was because the American government said to me that I'm a high risk to remain in the US, even though my visa, I'd, I'd always pay my taxes. And there was no issues, they said, because I didn't have a wife, I didn't have a mortgage, and I didn't have um, any money to come back to in the UK. Okay, that's and I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? Like, no wife, no, where, where's that in your rule book? Like, and I couldn't find it anywhere, and there's no rules about it. And I've had my visa rejected three or four times now. And I'm like, if you're rejecting people like me, like just because I've got no money on, or I'm a high risk, like my whole family's in the UK, like mm. everyone. Mm. So like, I've got nothing here in the UK. My whole family's here. Mm. I may not have any money, but who cares? Look at the person, not the bank account, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I found myself 2018, back of my mum and dad's crappy yellow sofa, um, feeling depressed, same feelings, back to where I wanted, didn't want to be. Yeah. I applied for over 250 jobs, didn't get a single one. Mm. I started working at Starbucks mm. and um, I was serving coffee to people. And during this time, one of the guys I used to play football with, um, he's done great for himself, plays professional football ever since. And he said to me, um, we had a, I was serving a coffee, looked up and it was him. And I, I gave him a coffee, we had a great chat. And at the end, he said to me, Chris, I'm sorry for the way things have turned out. And I was like, Phew. it blew my wind right in my sails because he was mm-hmm. saying everything that I knew. Like I wanted to be a professional football originally. I wanted to live mm-hmm. a life to help others. I wanted to make a difference in this world. And I was serving people coffee. Mm. And um, he meant it in the right way, but it really kicked my ass. Yeah. And I went into, into America. I went into Manchester at the same time, around the same area. And I saw all these homeless people. Mm. I was like, what's going on here? Like, I'm, I'm, maybe I was blinded to it or before I, I, I don't know, but, and I was like, is it the homeless people? Are they druggies, alcoholics? Is it their issue? Is it society's issue? And I was like, I'm very curious. So I think curious, um, what's it called? Uh, the curious mind is a wonderful book and it talks about how curiosity um, basically makes it get, gets you everywhere. So I was like, how do I find out more about homeless people? A friend of mine, Gemma has a, an organization called brew power yeah. where they go out and help homeless people in Manchester. So I thought I'd go out with her and I went out and saw these homeless people exactly that mm. they were people. Mm. All my stereotypes of them being druggies, alcoholics. Yeah, some people are drug addicts. Some people are alcoholics. Some people have relationship issues. Mm. Some people are really struggling in life, but they're people. Mm. And I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated. Um, I help run the organization now. And I, I, we're out every week, like I said, in Manchester. Coronavirus has been a bit different, though. We've yeah. really had to protect our volunteers. Um, but I'm all about connecting people. And it's not. A, I'm not here to say that I'm going to save the world through or any, I'm not going to save homeless people, but I'm going to try and build trust and friendship and connect to people to show them that, you know what, they can overcome this and they can get through anything. Mm. Whether it's a smile or I make one small difference in one person's life, then it's worth it, you know? Mm. Mm. Um, so yeah, and that was where really my journey to start helping homeless people. Um, I've actually seen a lot of homeless people abused by people coming out of offices and mm. I've been abused for helping homeless people with the, the, the statement of if they can't help themselves, Oh, we're not going to help them. Mm. And like, like, well, remember when you couldn't help yourself and you were struggling? Mm. Did you have a family member you could rely on, a friend that you could ask help for? Well, maybe some of these people don't have that. 
And even if they do, you know what? I'm not here to judge them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's really seeing the person as a person. And I started to realize that people think homeless is, homelessness is going to be an issue forever. And that actually you can't go from homelessness to a normal person back in society. And I wanted to show people you can. So I, 2019, I was 28 years old at the time. Um, I'm 29, I'm, no, 27, I'm 28 now. Mm -hmm. I decided that I would swim every lake in the Lake District. Now, for your, for your listeners from around the world, the Lake District is the biggest national park in England. Um, all the lakes added together, add to 53 miles. Now, my auntie calls me a social swimmer. I'm not a, I, I like the sauna, the steam room, the hot tub, <laughs> not so much the swimming. So yeah. I started training to swim all these 53 miles. And over the summer of 2019, I swam every single lake in the Lake District, um, well, all 53 miles of the lakes. And I finished on September the 8th, uh, the 11.7 mile swim of Lake Windermere, which is the longest lake in England. Yeah. It took me about nine hours. Wow. Um, and it kicked my ass both mentally and physically. Um, yeah. And basically I helped with the swim, we called it the swim for shelter campaign. My thing is that if I go through a challenge, it's always something that I'm not good at. Mm. So it shows people how much it means to me. Mm. Mm. And because if it, to really show it is a challenge, you know, and show me that to show people like, come on, get involved. You can, you can really help and make a difference. Mm. So help 36 homeless people go from the streets in Manchester um, to their, uh, into an educator, into, into an employment program mm -hmm. with the Booth Centre, which is an incredible charity in Manchester that helps homeless people. And that feeling of helping 36 people is really where I was like, wow, amazing. But I was actually still suffering with depression because every time I do, and a lot of adventurers or challenge, people who do crazy challenges suffer from this, is you do a crazy challenge, everything you focus on is on that challenge. After that challenge is finished, you don't know what, what, what am I going to focus on? What am I going to do? Like my whole six months have just been on this. So now you have a big come down. And I was really struggling with that come down because I was working a nine to five job that I didn't really particularly enjoy. The people were great, but it wasn't my passion. Um, and I started to really suffer with depression again. I couldn't keep doing these crazy challenges to make myself feel good. So I was like, what the hell am I going to do with my life? Like, yeah. so, and that's where kind of tales to inspire came but yeah yeah i was just it was i was just about to ask you this question <laughs> so um you know the work that you've been doing for the homeless i mean i think it's incredible we need more people like you in the world uh i mean it's a story of transformation like you wanted to be a footballer all the girls and the cars and then you've had what you basically your your spiritual awakening where you switched and it's and believe me helping other people there's no feeling like it like you know you can have the cards and the girls but helping people because you feel connected we're all interconnected at the end of the day um so you feel at home with uh these people now um what now you uh founded a tales to inspire um so tell us a bit about that because i know i was on it you uh, you got my story on it as well so um yeah tell us where did this idea came from from and what what were you hoping to achieve from it um the tales to inspire is quite interesting because um i was really suffering in september 2019 like september october i was going through depression again and no one my mom and dad don't even know about this you know and um i was really struggling and um i was like saying that i went out on the streets and i needed a breakthrough i needed something and a homeless person came up to me. I never met him before and never met him afterwards. And I don't often have light bulb moments, mm -hmm. um, but I had one. And he said to me, um, Chris, stories are the pages that make up that book we call life. Mm. Now, usually that, that wouldn't give me a light bulb moment, but for some reason it hit me. Uh, stories are the pages that make up that book we call life. So my, 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 my big epiphany was every person has a story. The question is, can we use that story to encourage people to never give up? Mm. So that's where literally that was what September, October, November the 3rd, I decided, right, let's do this. So it took about a month of preparation. I created tales to inspire.com and we shared Danny's story who was homeless for just over four years. Mm. And we shared his story on the platform on the website, just like written form of basically an interview I did with him. And Within one day, we had a young lady who got in contact with us um, and she said that she was going to commit suicide. She read Danny's story 
and basically we put the helplines in different organizations if you if you feel connected and seek help and she went and got help that was after one day that's amazing and within three days danny's story had been read in 15 countries around the world wow so i'm i'm starting to think like this this may go somewhere like who knows you know and then every week since we've released a story including yours uh, of a person who's the one thing is they've gone through something and come out of the other side so we can ins- encourage others to never give up mm-hmm. um, and that can be depression anxiety relationship struggles um, money uh, overcoming anything you know job crisis wh- whatever it is you know covid and mm-hmm. um, organ donation you name it we've we've got it and it can be as little as something really tiny or it can be huge yeah. because one person's small thing can be another person's mountain, you know? Mm-hmm. So ever since then, we've, we've done that. I've been on BBC Radio Manchester and we've, we're now um, basically doing our podcast, our Tales to Inspire podcast. And also we've got our book coming out soon, which is our Tales to Inspire book, um, which is going to come out with 20 inspirational stories to show people that despite 2020 has been a crap year for a lot of people, mm-hmm. there is still some good that you can overcome, you know? Yeah. Um, and your, your, your tales once again, are going to be in there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to go for. There's a lot of improvement I'm learning. I, I quit my job in January, completely oh. quit. It. Um, and basically people are like, how are you going to earn money? I was like, don't know. I'm just going to go in my passion and figure it out. So yeah. That's I, the best I created, way forward, I think. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is. <laughs> well, you <laughs> say that, but then you're struggling for money. I'm like, what? It's okay. It comes. It comes. If you have faith yeah. and if you have trust, it comes. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And actually the trust you talk about there is really important. I believe that uh, when we talk about peace and a lot of people look at Buddhism and oh, peace, go to the top of a mountain top and you have your robes and you, and you, you're very bliss and very Zen like, mm. and actually peace is where people trust each other. Yes. A peaceful society is not one that doesn't have war because look, if you don't have war, but the reason you don't have war is because everyone's got nuclear weapons. So the, basically the threat is you've got a nuclear weapon you don't want to detonate that nuclear weapon. Mm. So really, that's not trust. You actually don't trust anyone. Yeah. And you're just waiting for someone to pull the plug and then everything goes crazy. Mm. Really, it's built on true mutual trust of mm. people seeing people's potential. Um, so yeah, peace, peace is, and, and trust is, is huge as well. There's so many things we can talk about and yeah. there's so much that relates to a lot of people now, you know? Um, so what was, um, I, I always wanted to ask you this, what was your, um, the stories that you shared on Tales to Inspire? What was the, uh, what was the story that really, uh, not talking about my story, but, <laughs> but talking about someone else's story that really got to your heart. It was like, man, that is brutal. Uh, it's a lot of stories, a lot, a lot. And um, there's one particular story um, that kicked me for, like, it really knocked me for six, you know. Um, mm-hmm. It was a guy, a young man called Rory Tozer. Um, basically, he's based in Wales. He's a friend. He's one of the best friends of my, my brother-in-law, actually, uh, Josh. And um, I got, got to know about Rory and his story. He's, um, and he was basically a gym instructor and he told me that actually, Chris, I don't think I should share my story because I don't think it's that inspirational. Hmm. And I was like, just let me be the judge of that. And we'll figure it out from there, shall we? And he was like, yeah, but I don't, I don't think it's that inspirational. I was like, okay, no problem. And Rory um, got leukemia. Well, basically what happened is he started to get headaches and started to get this you know, like tinnitus, this ringing sound in his oh, ear. Yeah. And he was only a young lad. He was like a body, bodybuilder, like a muscly guy, personal trainer. And um, 26, 27 years old at the time, I believe, or 25. And the doctor kept going to the doctor. The doctor says, nothing wrong with you, nothing wrong with you. You're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Then one day he was watching TV with his brother and he had this massive explosion in his head. He didn't know, really know what happened. And basically what happened is he had a brain hemorrhage. Hmm. And basically his, he went deaf and he, was, he, he went, woke up. Next thing he did, he woke up in, in hospital. And he'd just been told that he'd just been told that he had a, a brain hemorrhage mm-hmm. and um, basically also got told that he's got leukemia mm-hmm. so blood cancer and he got told that he's basically not got long to live and mm-hmm. um, so they had to do an emergency emergency procedure on him and they got his blood his blood count back to kind of normal and got through it and then he had to have bone marrow transplant and mm-hmm. um, which for anyone who's been through bone marrow transplant it's it's 
it's brutal, very brutal. Mm-hmm. And he got that, survived it, was fine, and thankfully got through it. And then starting to look at his life again and recover after a year or two. And then he got diagnosed with leukemia again, a different type of leukemia. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he had to do bone marrow transplant again. Um, he's had now had, he, he, somehow he, he survived it and he got through it. He's just turned 30, mm. incredible young man. Um, and he's always like, he, he doesn't cut, he, does no, there's, he doesn't cut around the edges. He's quite brutal. He says like, don't expect me to say everything's going to be dandy. You're going to get through everything. Don't worry. Fact is you may die. He mm. says like, you may die. And that's, that, he's had to succumb to that and, you know, and really think about death. And that's the way things going to be. The acceptance but, of the way things are. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, and and he's now had um, the ma- the maximum amount of chemotherapy anyone can have. Full stop. He's not allowed to have any more. If he ever gets a cancer again, he's been told you can't have chemotherapy. Um, he's had he's had two bone marrow transplants. He's not allowed another one. Um, so, you know what I mean? Like he's really on his chances of really just taking each day as it comes. Mm. And when we release his tail, next door neighbors people who'd known him for years were reaching out to us and saying, wow, I didn't realize Rory went through this. Mm. Or wow, what an inspiration. I never knew Rory had any of these struggles. Mm. Or I always thought he was a a happy person who just took everything on board. And I never realized. So basically people who'd known him for the longest didn't really know him, Mm. you know? And I, I feel this is something in society that I go to the, I play cricket and I go to a local cricket club um, and I, I, I love it there, right? But how much do I know those people? I know them for playing cricket. Mm. I know them on the weekend when I play cricket, but I don't know the rest of their lives. Mm. How much do I know who, the, do I truly know who they are? Mm. And something I'm starting to think about now is to stop just saying, hey, Hammy, how are you doing? It's good to see you again. It's to actually say, how are you doing? Like, how are you? Mm. Like, do you really make that spiritual and human to human connection to actually care about the person? Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I'd say Rory's story is something that it, it shocked me. It really shocked me. First of all, the fact that he didn't think it was inspirational. Yeah. Se- secondly, I kind of had to drag it out of him to like beg him to share his tale once he did share it with me. And yeah, it, it was just absolutely incredible um, from what he went through. But we've had so many inspirational stories. Um, yeah. Just just so many. I mean, Sarinda Sapal, who donated her kidney to a complete stranger and saved the baby, saved the life of a two-year-old baby, Anaya, mm. um, is another one that, yeah, knocks me for six. Um, or Brendan Rendall, the guy who just ran across Africa and, mm. um, to help children in Malawi. There's so many people. Yeah, and, it's just such um, an amazing like uh, platform. I mean, uh, sharing inspiring stories because our world really needs it right now. Um, and another thing that you said about, um, you know, nobody knows what you're going through. So be kind to each other. You know, that's the main message is that be kind to each other. Um, because, you know, you could be going through hell. You know, you never know the person next to you, standing next to you, maybe feeling so suicidal, but they're laughing their head off. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanna, there's one thing actually that uh, Mahatma Gandhi talks about. Now, Mahatma Gandhi is one of my uh, like favorite people in the world, right? And um, he talks about, you must not lose faith in humanity. Mm. Humanity is an ocean. If a few drops of the ocean are dirty, the whole, the whole ocean does not become dirty. Imagine you're in a relationship and the girl's got blonde hair. So I'm in a relationship, the girl's got blonde hair. And it goes badly. She cheats on me, okay? Does that mean now I'm not going to go out with anybody who's got blonde hair? Mm-hmm. You know? And mm-hmm. the whole ocean does not become dirty just because one person is, did something wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's like really seeing that and this is true to me as well and this is true to you personal development i am krish because i try and practice personal development or i call it human revolution um, and and nietzsche buddhists who practice with the sgi I call it human revolution to do the best i can i can be a murderer i can be a good person the choice is with me right here right now now i, I feel like if i do one bad thing right now Say if I, I did a terrible thing, the other people would be offended. They'd feel horrendous. They'd be like, I can't believe we trusted Krish. Oh, I always thought he was a good person. Boom, 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 boom. But the actual thing is I made a mistake. Hmm. And actually I may be a good person or I may be a bad person, but each one of us makes good decisions and bad decisions. 
that's life i'm afraid mm. um so whether and but the thing the easy thing is for us to judge and I, like i said before we don't believe in absolutes don't don't go in absolutes this person's good this person's great mm. um to swim the distances i swam every single day i had to build on it i had to mm. build on it mm. i started with a kilometer and i did 1.5 then two kilometers training to get to where i needed to go okay so with life right now i'm starting every single day every single day small steps developing myself to build on that build on that and build on that mm. now if i take a week off guess what i'm starting back down again and i got to start up again mm. so we need to we really need to make a big transformation in the way we judge other people it, it's not acceptable in my opinion and we need to we need to do that. i mean adolf hitler adolf hitler got a message from mahatma gandhi during world war 2 and guess what the starting words were what? dear friend <laughs> You know, and he was trying to connect to, um, there's a great book, um, a fantastic book by a guy called Simon Sebag Montefiore, Montefiore, and it's called Letters That Change the World. I definitely recommend it to anyone. Um, and reading's a huge part of, um, I wouldn't say I'm a natural reader, but I'd really try to read podcasts and all sorts mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I'd definitely say develop on your reading as well. Oh, amazing. Um, so before we get into the rapid fire questions, because uh, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, is there any last message that you would like to uh, say to someone who's going through perhaps their spiritual awakening, they're going through depression or they're not getting what they want in life, anything that, that you know, basically hard times. What is, what is the one thing that you could say to them, uh, that will up, uplift, uplift them? That's a great question, you know, um, and I think it's really important. Uh, yeah, with um, regards to that, like we're going on a once in a lifetime pandemic right now. Okay. But also you can see it as a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the, the amazing uh, poet and philosopher uh, in the USA from the 19th century said that to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you be something else mm. is, the, is the greatest accomplishment. Yes. I, I feel like we can all be unique. We are all unique. And we have to show that I am Krish and I can be the best Krish that I can be. I can't be the best Madea I can be because I'm not Madea. Hmm. So the one beautiful thing is we are all unique. So really look within and bring that uniqueness without, you know, and stop trying to say um, that I'm going to be someone else. Say, so, yeah, because someone else has done it, I can do it. But don't try and carbon copy the other person because um, you can't carbon copy someone else. And another thing that I struggle with is patience. I'm the least patient person in the world. And like just to persevere, just to keep going, as long as you know your direction, as long as you know there's an end goal, you may not have the plan. You may not know you're going to get there. Uh, you may not know how you're going to get there as long as you know you are going to get there. And I think that's what I base my whole life on is determinations is redetermining if i fail no problem that's fine i'm going to go again mm. making a mistake no problem redetermine make it even greater re redetermination to overcome the negative that's in myself you know so yeah just to make sure that you never give up don't judge yourself don't live in regrets don't think oh i've caused a sin just redetermine i made a negative no problem i'm going to make a positive mm. um, and keep making good causes to get even greater effects and um, the, the law of cause and effect is huge oh, that is beautiful um well that just leads on to a rapid fire questions <laughs> dun, dun, dun. i'll get my uh, pen and paper ready yeah. da, da, da. well it's not many it's not many it's just few <laughs> okay, go for it. okay so what is your definition of god <laughs> Good one. Uh, rapid fire so is it a one word answer or do you want to well, no no just any just any you can be so um as obviously not like three hours <laughs> no so my my definition of god is the universe the person the way i look at god is actually yeah. the way i used to look at god is this person or this human who looks down upon people and tells people how it should be done and moves these chess pieces mm -hmm. because you've got to go to god's god's game mm -hmm. the way i look at god is god is the universe it exists within all of us and, and, and exists within everything mm -hmm. and not just within this world or in this planet, but the universe. Yeah. Um, so that, that's my definition of God. Okay. Um, I've already asked you this, but it's still in the question I'm going to recall. Uh, so how do you define spirituality and w w spirituality versus religion? Um, religion, I see it as the organization. Mm -hmm. 
um, spirituality, I see it deepen, deepening your faith on and deepening, getting to know who you are personally even more. Mm, beautiful. What's the lesson that took you longest to learn? The lesson that took you longest to learn. What a great question. <laughs> um, the lesson that took me longest to learn is that things aren't the most important. So for example, girls, cars, money, um, all that kind of stuff. I always thought that was the most important thing. And then getting a job, another thing, get, just get a job, get a nine to five job. How could you, you're unsuccessful if you've not got a job. Mm. or you know what I mean and just so the lesson that took me longest to learn actually was not succumbing to society's wants and needs Mm. Mm. amazing okay so what do you think happens when you die oh yay I love that (laughs) so I used to think death was something that it's just actually you die and that's it bye-bye cheerio but I started to realize especially with my buddhist practice to see that energy never never stops in the universe energy never ever stops Mm. Now we've just talked about it. We are, we are one with the universe. Every part of me is a particle from this universe. So why would we think that just because we die, our energy stops? Mm. So from my perspective, yes, our body goes into the ground or we die or whatever, but there's actually no energy never stops. So you carry on. If you go into your spirituality, you look at the nine level of consciousnesses. Now I can talk about the nine levels of consciousness all day long. I love them. I would recommend people to check it out. Um, The ninth level, eighth and ninth level of consciousness talk about how you can, how you get so far beyond that life continues forever. Mm. And whether that's in a human form, whether that's on this planet or in this universe, that I really feel that there is no, it's basically you die, you have a, you have a sleep and then you wake up refreshed and awakened for the next life or the Mm. same life, but wherever you may be. So I look at it as life and death as sleeping. And remember that death as well is if you th- were going to live forever, you would never value life. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to live forever. Hey, I can do whatever I want. I'm living forever. Mm. But if now the fact that you know you're not going to live forever, it means that you have to appreciate and value the life you have. Mm. Amazing. Um, so my greatest passion is? My greatest passion. Mm. Um, I could go with the typical helping people. Um, I'm, I'm, but... My greatest passion is realize is helping people realize their own potential. Oh, beautiful! Um, that's that's my my greatest passion. Um, I'm fully in present moment when. Ooh, I'm fully in the present moment. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> really grilling you now, aren't I? <laughs> um, probably three three places on earth uh, when I'm fully in the present moment is when I'm having one to one conversations with people. Hmm. I feel like it's really important to be in the present moment. Mm. Um, when I'm chanting, so when I'm chanting my when I chant my practice, when Nam Yoho Renge Kyo in the morning and the evening, mm. I, I really try and be fully in present moment there and then. And um, third is when when I'm when I'm doing something I love. So whether that's fishing or whether that's playing sports, uh, football. I love football. I love cricket. Sports are my life, mm. um, or things like that. So yeah, I, I'm. Those are my three: connecting with people, sports, and chanting. Mm. Amazing. Um, okay, so one last uh, question. The world needs more of what? The world needs more of what? It's a great question. Um, the world needs more, in my opinion. It needs more lions and less sheep. Now, when I say that, I mean that sheep follow other sheep, okay? We all do We all do what others do, and sometimes we don't know the reason why we do it, you know? Um, we In society, we watch an advert on the television, and the next day, everyone's buying that trainer, or those clothes that Nike have just produced from that advert. Um, you know what I mean? So like, we all, we, all, we all do things that others do, but often we don't know the reason behind it. Mm. And I, I'm really standing up for our individuality, our uniqueness, to stand up for the respect and dignity of life. Now, mm. when I say that, I mean, you be you, you do what you need to do, you stand up for justice, but you do it on the respect of life. You don't do it in, in case or in spite of anyone else. So. We're not standing on top of other people's dreams and saying, you're never going to become this. Mm. We're saying, you know what? I'm going to achieve my dream and I'm going to help you achieve your dream as long as it's based on the respect and dignity of life. Mm. And that means that actually we can both achieve our dreams together. For some reason, we think as humans, I can achieve my dreams, but it has to be to the sacrifice of everyone else. Mm. No, Mm. we can all do it. And the question is, are you willing to be a lion 
one who you, you like stands up and says, you know what, I'm going to bring my uniqueness. I'm going to bring my courage, my wisdom and my compassion to this. And we're going to change the world together. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's like, it's like um, why 18 when you were born to stand out, right? <laughs> so, exactly. Completely. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, Trish. I mean, um, how can people uh, contact you? Um, so to contact me personally, I would, I would probably say, go through the Tales to Inspire um, website, which is www.talestoinspire.com. Um, I'm sure you probably put this in your show notes or yeah. on Facebook or Instagram or whatever as well. Um, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Tales to Inspire. Um, and yeah, just get in contact. Anyone with any inspirational stories, any questions, any um, do motivational talks and workshops and all sorts. Um, we connect with different charities. We've got a book coming out, a podcast. There's so much to, that we do and that I'm when trying is, to achieve. When is the book and the podcast coming out? Do you know the so date? So the podcast coming out in September. Mm-hmm. Um, so the podcast aims to come in September with a whole new rebranding. Um, and then the book, actually people can pre-order the book. Uh, we're doing a Kickstarter campaign. That's going to be coming out um, at the end of September, start of October. And for our November the 3rd, our one year anniversary, our book's going to come out for November the 3rd um, to really show that impact that we can make a difference in this world, you know. Oh, amazing. Oh, thank you so much, Krish, for uh, being here. I mean, you know, when I first met you, it's like, oh my God, this guy is so amazing. And he's been through a bit of a transformation himself, you know, and helping people. Um, I, I haven't come across many people like that. And uh, yeah, so I'm, it was an absolute honor interviewing you today. Oh man, thank you so much. for that. Thank you so much for having me on and for everything you represent. I mean, I'm sure your listeners will get to know more about your story and I don't want to spoil it, but your story is just mind blowing. And the show, the proof, the proof, proof is actually everything, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. if you can show actual tangible proof mm-hmm. and you talked about religion and spirituality, if your religion gets you nowhere and you have no proof of any benefit of it, stop practicing it. Mm-hmm. If you feel your spirituality that you're doing gets you no proof of feeling any better or doing any good, mm-hmm. stop doing it. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think the fact that you show proof of what you do, um, and if we can show proof, um, I think that's so important. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, of for course. coming. Yes, Thank Medea. You. Have a great, Thank have a wonderful you. day. Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram, Madhya Sosan. You can also check out my website, madhyasosan.com. If you would like to watch this episode, then head over to my YouTube channel, Mads Corner, M-A-D-Z Corner. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends. Thank you once again, and I will see you on the next episode.